It is always my joy to be here. And today is no different. Today's word comes from John 20, 24 in the New Revised Standard Version. Actually, 24 through 29. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the 12, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand on his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for this day, this beautiful day. We thank you for all you have done. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for everything, every breath, every movement. We ask your blessings upon this house. There is nothing on this paper but words and it is nothing without your spirit. Hide me behind the cross. Let these words edify your people as you see fit. In the name of Jesus I pray, amen. Today's word is with my own eyes. The message version reads, but Thomas, sometimes called the twin, one of the 12, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, we saw the master. But he said, unless I see the nail holes in his hands, put my finger in the nail holes and stick my hand in his side, I won't believe it. Eight days later, the disciples were again in the room. This time, Thomas was with them. Jesus came through the locked doors, stood among them and said, peace to you. Then he focused his attention on Thomas. Take your finger and examine my hands. Take your hand and stick it in my side. Don't be unbelieving, believe. Thomas said, my master, my God. Jesus said, so you be be believe because you've seen with your own eyes. Even better blessings are in store for those who believe without seeing. When I was growing up, I would always hear people say, don't be a doubting Thomas. At the time, I had no idea what that meant. I didn't know who Thomas was, so, okay. I'm thinking, why not say don't be a doubting Marsha? Made more sense to me. As I got older, I realized they were actually referring to this particular part of scripture and the resurrection story. But I believe that Thomas may have gotten a bad rap because can you, Imagine being stuck on the bad part of your story, never, never being referred to by the way you got better. Poor Thomas, always doubting Thomas, never the finally I believed Thomas. Nonetheless, this first part of the story is where Jesus appeared to the disciples and Thomas was not there. Not sure where he was, maybe he went to the store, but whatever, he was not in the room. And when he returned, they told him that they had seen the Lord. Now, I'm not sure what led Thomas to question this account. I mean, he had been riding with these people for a minute. And suddenly, you know, they like, we saw the Lord. He's like, uh, sure you did. Um, <laughs> but nonetheless, you know, there was the account of the disciples and the women and everyone else that was there. However, Whatever, Thomas was like, yeah, okay, whatever, you know. When I first read this, I was like, ooh, come on, Thomas, everybody lied. I mean, they're all telling you this. These are your friends. This is your family, the people you've been rolling with for a minute. Don't you believe them? 
But one of the things I've preached frequently in the last few weeks is how easily we, we might be tempted, or in particular, maybe not you, but I might be tempted to say, I wouldn't have questioned them. These are my friends. And I certainly would have believed it because, you know, Jesus has said before that he was going to come back. But I think that that is probably incorrect. Because, you see, I know that I, possibly not you, because I dare not say we, because, you know, I don't want to speak for you. I would say that if Jesus were in here today, we might be like, not sure. And even before, when Jesus, if we had walked with Jesus, <laughs> he would be like, I'm going to come back. We'd be like, sure, Jesus, you're going to die and then come back. Okay. So we shouldn't possibly be so critical of what we see and hear. Because we read the Bible and we're always saying, I would have done that. I wouldn't have done that. But I'm not sure, because today with our families and our friends, do we always believe what they say? Are we quick to believe if someone says to us, I think the Spirit is saying to me that I should? Or I've prayed and the Lord says I should. Do we believe it quickly? Or is there that little part of us that says, well, okay, if you say so. So perhaps we ought not be so critical of poor Thomas. So here's Thomas saying, until I see the place where he was nailed in his hands and pierced in his side, I'm not going to believe it. And it's not so far-fetched. Didn't matter what anyone else saw. Didn't matter what anyone else said. Thomas was about the business of with my own eyes. I mean, what he had seen with his own eyes was that Jesus had been crucified. That he knew. The thing is, many of us are really, you know, we've got to remember, today we are like that. We are like that. And it doesn't matter. Because, you see, we've been so calloused by what happens on the Internet and what happens in the news and what we see and what can be changed and what on video can be switched. We don't even know what's real anymore. And whether that happened then or now, we can be as skeptical as we choose. And anyone who's ever had to rely on an eyewitness account knows that they cannot necessarily be dependent upon to be exact. Four people can see four different things at the same time. We always hope that they're accurate, but I always think about the fact that my brother who was a policeman in Detroit, used to say, every time I go to an accident or something that happens, we ask the eyewitnesses and I hold my breath. And I pray that I even get two people to say the same thing because you just never know. And one of the things that I always thought was wise was, he said, because we have been raised in different places with different experiences and different educations, and even with different parents, and sometimes even with the same par parents, those things have an effect on how we see things. That same thing played a part back then. And so even though these disciples had been riding with Jesus, it is possible that each of them had different experiences. Think about it. We didn't hear of Thomas being with John, James, Peter, riding close with Jesus. So it's possible that Thomas may not have had the same experiences. So maybe he had a reason for being just a little bit more skeptical. Even though we know he saw the big things, maybe he just didn't quite hear as much. And even at that, the whole time everybody was riding with Jesus or was going with Jesus when he was teaching and preaching and telling them, but I must be crucified. 
but in three days I will return. They didn't believe it then. Here they were, in the midst of it. And right after the women came back from the tomb, they were still kind of like, y'all saw what? Be careful when you say you don't believe. After Jesus' visit, by the way, uh, which, by the way, was in, G in John's version, version, also includes Jesus breathing the Holy Spirit on them, that's when Thomas showed up. So now, the rest of the disciples not only have seen the Lord, but they have this Holy Spirit breathed on them, and Thomas has none of this. So here's Thomas walking into the room. They're feeling... And Thomas is like, really, y'all? <laughs> so eight days later, by which time I'm sure Thomas is feeling some kind of way, Jesus shows up in the midst of them and addresses Thomas's questions of eight days ago. Now, as an aside, I think it's interesting that all the doors were locked and Jesus appears in the midst of them, says, peace be with you, and addresses Thomas's questions and Thomas is not convinced at that moment because the doors are locked Jesus appears starts to answer your questions and he has not seen nor heard it you're not convinced already Thomas okay but you know let's go further I wouldn't need any more proof I'm not sure you would have but we still got Thomas anyhow Jesus gives Thomas permission to see and touch his scars and says, do not doubt but believe, according to the New Revised Standard Version. Now, many of the references say that in the Greek, that word should not be doubt, but rather should be unbelief. And so, in many of the other versions also say, don't doubt. And so, I wasn't sure I really even cared because I didn't know whether or not there was enough difference between unbelief and doubt for it to really make a difference. But there is. See, doubt is defined as an inclination to believe or accept a claim met, met with doubt. Uncertainty or belief or an opinion that often interferes with decision making. A deliberate suspension of judgment. All of these things are about what happens in our head. Doubt is a mind issue. It's about seeing and hearing about things happening and making an informed decision to question whether or not to question or trust what we have seen and heard. Because we live in different spaces and have different experiences and in many instances have been educated in different ways, we each experience life through our own lens. We talked about this. This leads us to see with our own eyes and keeps us sometimes from expanding our experiences with the benefit of other people's lenses. So a lot of what we've learned and experienced, like we said, can have an effect on how we see or hear in another situation. Where doubt is a matter of the head, unbelief is a matter of the heart. And that makes it a matter of faith. And for us, that's why the translation makes a difference. What if in Thomas's case, let's say, Jesus is not trying to examine Thomas's head, but rather to fix his heart? Because if we consider what we know about Jesus, Jesus is never about changing our minds, but rather changing our hearts and allowing our hearts to change our minds. He was trying to move Thomas from unbelief to belief rather than from doubt to believe. Not trying to mess with his mind at all, but rather to go for his heart. 
Jesus simply comes into the room and gives Thomas the opportunity to not just see, but to touch his scars. He tells him, touch my hands, touch my side, to prove not only that he is Jesus by sight identification, but that it is the same Jesus who was crucified the week before because he can be touched and the scars are real. As Thomas acknowledges Jesus as my Lord and my God, or in the message version, my master and my God, Jesus then addresses the heart issue, the issue of faith. Jesus then asks Thomas if he only believes because he has seen. Now, I have often heard this preached with a level of sarcasm, kind of a, do you believe just because you have seen Thomas? But what if Jesus is, in fact, not being sarcastic, but rather simply addressing the larger issue which sits before all of the disciples, including Thomas, that issue of faith? This is why I like the message version better, because it simply makes a statement. You believe because you have seen. You know, it's all about not what you say, but how you say it. These disciples, including Thomas, are the only eyewitnesses to the complete story. The complete story, not only seen, but heard from Jesus. And they must begin to tell it for the ages. Each of these disciples must begin to tell the story everywhere they go. Jesus knows that he is leaving them in a fight. He is equipping them with the Holy Spirit to fight, but he knows that it is still a battle. Thomas needed to be ready, but he wasn't there yet. Jesus needed all of them to be ready because they were going out to tell their story to those who had heard about the crucifixion, if not having seen him crucified, but had not, but had not seen him necessarily resurrected. Their faith in what they knew had to be strong. They were about to build the church. They had to be convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt on, well, that what they had seen with their own eyes was enough to witness to people who A, may not have believed in the resurrection of the dead, according to the Sadducees, may have seen Jesus hanging on the cross and knew he was dead. And if we look at Matthew's version, there were soldiers who might possibly have been bribed to tell another story altogether that the disciples had stolen Jesus' body and put it somewhere else. And you know how stories go. So since Jesus was talking to Thomas, it is possible that he also might have been talking to the other disciples by proxy since they were in the room. And it does not say that this was a private conversation. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. The message version says even better blessings are in store for those who believe without seeing. And since everyone in that room had seen, who was Jesus talking about? Well, I believe that he was talking about everyone after them, including us, especially us. But what do we do when the basis of our belief requires us to believe without actually seeing? We are equipped with that same spirit. We are the blessed who have come to believe without actually having seen. We must proclaim a savior that lives and whom we witness to with our hearts and through the spirit. And belief, like unbelief, is a faith issue. It's an issue that goes right to the heart of who we are, who we say we are, and what we believe. Our question is, do we actually believe 
what we say we believe? Are we actually who we say we are? We make the choice, but we make that choice in our hearts and allow our minds to follow. We do not make that head choice. We can say we believe with our mouths and harbor unbelief in our hearts, or we commit to fully believing through the spirit in our hearts and carry it with us every day. It is a faith issue. Hebrews 11.1, 1, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. This relates directly back to Jesus' statement to Thomas because it's a statement of faith. Blessed are those who believe and have not seen. Blessed are those who walk in faith, the assurance of things hoped for, and the conviction of things not seen. This is why Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please God, for whoever would approach him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So often we hear today reward money and physical things. No. Sometimes I just want to say stop it. Our faith rewards us with the knowledge of God's love and the understanding of people and what we need to do in this world. Our knowledge rewards us with what Jesus gives us. The understanding of who we are and our place in this world. Because without faith, we cannot at the very least believe who God is. And we cannot believe that Jesus was crucified and resurrected. Jesus showed himself to Thomas allowed him to hear, touch, and see as an example of redemption and salvation. Thomas's confession of belief is confirmed as he calls Jesus my Lord and my God. It is very much akin to Peter when Jesus asks him, who do you think I am? And Peter says, you are the Messiah. Jesus tells Peter then, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but God in heaven. Romans 10 and 8 goes further and says, but what does it say? The word is near you on your lips and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and is so justified, and one confesses with the mouth and is so saved. I don't think Jesus berates Thomas for his unbelief. He simply meets Thomas where he is and moves him from unbelief to belief. As an example for us, not to berate people for not believing, but rather just to move them by our actions, by who we are. Thomas believes and confesses his faith by acknowledging Jesus, my master and my God, and so is justified and saved. It was the same way for the criminal on the cross. Salvation was his the moment he said to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. This was not him hedging his bets at the last minute. He had to believe that Jesus was who he said he was in order to make that request. When he, the moment he said Jesus and made his request, Jesus said, truly, I say to you, you will be with me in paradise. It's not complicated. While we are not eyewitnesses to the crucifixion, we are witnesses by faith of the crucifixion and the resurrection, and we witness to the results of that by believing in our hearts who Jesus is. Believing that God resurrected him from the dead, that Jesus is our savior, 
For that is what our faith is built on. And the results of that is what we have seen with our own eyes. Amen. Let love lead. Let God lead. Let love lead. Let love lead. Let God lead. Let love lead. We begin to succeed when the cares of our lives begin and end with the hurt of others. Yeah. We begin to breathe when the wounds of others Come relieved with the love of others. Oh. He who looks around to find who's in need has made the best investment as a human being. You know that he who looks around to find who's in need has made the best investment in his legacy. I say that love will never force, love will never quit, love ain't never lose. And love ain't never miss Of all things lasting there remains only three When money can't buy Only these will succeed Faith, hope, and love The greatest of these is love So here is a formula For every hard situation Just let God Thank you. 